41 is our first song. If you wish to turn to that or watch the screen above me at the appropriate time, Brother John McDaniel leading our singing this morning. Brother Ricky Spake will lead our minds in prayer at the appropriate time. Chad Dollahite will bring us the message of the hour. And Stephen Cooper will conclude our service in prayer this morning at the appropriate time. An update on those that have been on our prayer list. Marilyn Intrican, Jan and Joyce's mother, continues in intensive care, but they're hopeful that they can uh, get her to a room, hopefully today. We'll see that if that happens, but she is improving and we're glad to report that. You're asked to remember Nicole Wilson, who has a uh, doctor's appointment tomorrow. She's having some pregnancy complications. You're asked to remember her. Leroy Dedman has also been able to go home from the hospital. He was in the hospital here locally in Carrollton for a few days last week, but at last report, he was able to go home. Jim Johnson, Hooper's brother-in-law, is now home from the hospital, but he still desires a part in our prayer, and he is very thankful for all the cards that we have sent to him. Are there others that we should mention? Yes, sir. Okay, Catrice, Catrice Howard, uh, the wife of a gospel preacher, Brother Howard at uh, New Hope Road, is to have surgery tomorrow. Okay, any others? <clears throat> Several events wish to bring to your attention again and remind you of the uh, Vacation Bible School follow-up planning meeting, which will be 5 o'clock here this afternoon, if uh, you would make your plans to be present for that event. Brothers Keepers Group 3, Jake and Julie's group, will meet after the evening service tonight. Again, the uh, sack lunch, sack dinner will be the theme. Bring your uh, uh, lunch to eat or your dinner to eat, and for the money that you would have spent on that, we'll provide that for a mission effort sponsored here by the congregation at Bremen. That will be after the evening service in the Fellowship Hall Group 3. Brothers Keepers Group 2, Ricky and Cindy's group, their project is due next Sunday. For those interested in uh, helping with the uh, Golden Age Banquet, we still need someone to head up that event in October. Please see Mark Clark. Also, you may have noticed several of the grocery bags in the foyer. We're asking for your assistance to help us fill up our food pantry and also be ready for the children's own food truck, which will be here next month. Ladies Devo, this coming Thursday, 11 a.m., Finger Foods are the fair. Ladies Day at Lithia Springs coming up August the 10th. Youth Rally at Pinville. Cliff Goodwin, the speaker, also Saturday, August the 10th. Would you bow with me, please? Kind of gracious Father, we're grateful for the many blessings of life. We're grateful that we have the opportunity this side of eternity to meet with those of like precious faith in this place today. Father, we're grateful that everything is as well with us as it is the many blessings of life that you shower upon us. Father, we're mindful of several that is our part in our prayer that we've mentioned specifically this morning. Father, there are several others that are infirm that prevents them from being here where they would like to be. Father, we're mindful of those that could have been here that have chosen not to be. Father, we're thankful for thy mercy and thy grace and thy long suffering toward us. Father, may we worship thee acceptably in thy sight today and may we edify one another as a result. Father, we ask that you be with each man who has a leading part in our worship this morning, especially Brother Johnny as he leads us in worship and song. Brother Chad as he breaks unto us the bread of life, and the men who wait and serve the Lord's Supper, and for those men who lead prayers. Father, continue to watch over and care for us. Forgive us when we fail thee. May we always strive to do what's right, serve thee faithfully, love thee supremely. This is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue our worship now and stand and sing number 41. We have heard the joyful sound, Jesus said.
Before the Lord's Supper this morning, number 517. 517. <clears throat> 517. We'll sing all three verses and then the chorus. The blood that stained the old rug, rugged cross. All three verses and then the chorus. Pray with me, please. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful that he went to that old awful cross for each one of us. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that you bless this bread, and as we take of this bread, we think back of the body that was slain on each one of our behalves. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for him and everything that he did for us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray this prayer. Amen.
Did we miss anyone in our survey? Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this cup, which represents the blood that was shed on that cross for our sins. Our Heavenly Father, we pray as we partake of this that we do so in the rightful and respectful manner. In Christ's name, amen. Did we overlook anyone serving at the cup? This concludes the Lord's Supper as another act of worship. We're commanded to give back to God as we've been prospered. Would you pray with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for everything that you give to us. Our Heavenly Father, as we look at our lives, we can never be able to repay every blessing that you give to us. Our Heavenly Father, we're th so thankful for this congregation of your saints which meets here. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that as we give back to you a portion of everything that you give to us, we pray these funds will go to spread your kingdom, that others will have this blessing that's in our lives. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.
Number two, a wonderful Savior. Number two. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. A Amen. Before our prayer this morning, number 51. Number 51. <clears throat> Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. Let's bow. 
Dear God, we thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day that we can come together with fellow Christians and learn more about your word. We're thankful for the health that, it, that we're able to be here. And we pray for those that are not in good health. We pray for the ones in the hospitals, the ones at, ho the ones at home. We pray that you'll bless them and help them to get well, if it be thy will. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you loved us enough to send your only begotten Son into this world to die on the cross instead of us. We pray that we, we will remember this and live our lives accordingly. We're thankful for the Bible. We're thankful that it, it is our guide, that if we will read it and study it, we will go to heaven one day. Pray that you'll continue to be with us as we go through this service. Pray that you'll be with us in our everyday walks of life. Pray that we'll be good examples to our families and to our friends as we go out into the world. Also, Heavenly Father, we pray that you might forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This morning, our invitation song will be number 36. Number 36, if you would like to mark that, number 36. And before the lesson, number 239, 239. Let's stand and sing all three verses of number 239 before the lesson, and let's sing out together. The great physician now is pulpit mic's acting a little funny today, so we're going to go with the lapel. Before I get into the sermon this morning, uh, one word comes to mind, and that is, wow. Uh, when we were here in May of last year, talking to the elders about coming to uh, work with the congregation, and when we were talking to the elders of course, I had already committed to be at uh, camp last year during Vacation Bible School, but uh, the elders had told me on a couple of different occasions that they said, Vacation Bible School at Bremen is a big deal. And you weren't kidding. Uh, what a great week we had last week. Uh, just really, really enjoyed it. Brother Jimmy uh, made a, a few announcements earlier, thanking several people who helped out in various ways and um, Certainly, that, those people are, are to be commended. Everybody who pitched in and helped make it as great as it was, uh, that's, that is one of the best vacation Bible schools that I have ever been a part of and look forward to uh, doing many more. But uh, it was wonderful, and I've, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. 
I also want to thank Johnny for on the fly getting some songs to go with my lesson because I totally forgot to let you know. Uh, as we stood up to sing, I thought, oh yeah, <laughs> I was going to let Johnny know what I was preaching on this morning because there are several songs in our songbook, or at least the one that I had in mind was the one that Johnny uh, led right before the sermon, and that is uh, Jesus the Great Physician. That's what we're talking about uh, this morning, Jesus the Great Physician. <clears throat> in Jeremiah's day, Jeremiah asked the question, and uh, one of my instructors, Richard Curry at the Memphis School of Preaching, he, he died around 2004, 2005, but uh, if you ever asked Brother Curry, what's your favorite verse in the book of Jeremiah, he would lower his voice and he would say, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? That was his favorite verse from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 8, verse 22. The problem in Jeremiah's day was not that there was not a physician. It was not that there was no balm in Gilead. The problem is they were going to what Job would put it as physicians of no value. Job 13, 4, he's talking to his friends there, if you want to use that term, with friends like that as they say you don't need enemies. <clears throat> they started off pretty well. They came and they sat seven days with Job and they didn't say a word. The problem came when they opened their mouth. And you know, sometimes when we try to comfort friends to this day, the problem comes when we open our mouths. Sometimes the best thing we can do for somebody who's hurting, who's suffering, is just to sit with them and be there for them. But anyway, they open their mouths and they start criticizing Job and they say, well, you know, you've really messed up and you need to just make this right and, and God will take this away and he'll bless you and things will be good like they were before. And Job over and over says, you know, that's not the case. And I don't believe Job ever claimed to be sinless, but he's saying that, look, I haven't done some great sin that's bringing this upon me. I don't know what you're talking about. And they keep saying, no, no, Job, you know what it is. Just, just repent. Let us, you know, confession is good for the soul. You can sort of hear him saying that. And in Job 13, 4, he's had enough. He says, you're all forgers of lie. You are physicians of no value. You know, they had them back then. We have them now in a physical sense, but they're also physicians of no value in a spiritual sense. And that's what Judah did in the days of Jeremiah. They were going to idols. They were going to pagan nations for help instead of just lifting their eyes upward and turning to God Almighty. And I submit to you that today many people do exactly the same thing. In Isaiah's time, Isaiah prophesied to the northern kingdom of Israel. He also prophesied some to the southern kingdom, but uh, his, his work spanned both uh, the northern kingdom and after it fell on into the time of just the southern kingdom. But uh, let me read to you from Isaiah 1, beginning at verse 4. Isaiah's speaking here on behalf of God. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. <clears throat> Why should you be stricken any more? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head, there is no soundness in it but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. That's a very graphic picture there of their situation spiritually. They needed a doctor. It's scary when you're sick in a, in a very real way because sometimes, number one, you don't know what's wrong. And you say, boy, is this serious? Because, you know, sometimes it could be. <clears throat> I, we, I've heard of a, a situation where someone was having headaches and thought, well, you know, I'm just having headaches. Turned out they had a brain tumor, a, a massive brain tumor uh, that ended up taking that person's life. So, you know, you... You may take something as simple as a headache and you think, well, is it a headache or is it something serious? Is it a symptom of something uh, more uh, acute? It's sometimes, you know, my brother-in-law one time, he was having uh, some, some tightness and pain in his chest and he thought, well, I'm having serious heart problems. Well, it turned out it was, uh, I believe it was indigestion or something like that. You know, sometimes it can be something minor, sometimes not. So there's the scariness of not knowing what is wrong. There's also the scariness of, putting your life literally many times in the hands of somebody that sometimes you don't even know. And you're trusting that he is who he, who he claims to be and that he's as knowledgeable as you expect him to be. And so there's, there's something about going to a, a physician that is a little bit unnerving. When you know somebody, and you, especially if somebody has vouched for a person, man, I went to this doctor, he, he fixed me right up, he did great. And I, I, a lot of you, several of you, 
Uh, when I hurt my ankle so bad at camp, several people were saying, you know, go to this uh, doctor in Carrollton. So, you know, I've been to him, or I know somebody went to him, did great. You know, so some of you even told, told me he worked on my knee, he worked on my ankle. He did all these different things and just really helped me out a lot. Well, that makes it a lot easier. And so then it can be a great comfort going to the doctor because you realize this fellow knows how to help. But of course, you know the greatest physician of all is Jesus, the great physician. We've looked in the last seven weeks or so at seven things that God hates. I say seven weeks or so because we took a week break in there when Brother Waldron was here. But we looked at seven things that God hates. And when you get infected with one of those diseases, you're in a bad way. You need some help. And that's why I kind of wanted to look this morning at Jesus, the great physician, because he offers Help. He can help us out when we're sin sick, and all of us are at some point or another, Romans 3.23, and we're in need of a physician spiritually. You've heard me say this before. I'll, I'll say it over and over again. What Jesus says in Luke 5.31 and 32, they that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. And he says, he goes on to say in the next verse, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Paraphrasing that in, in modern day terminology, and it's not original to me, but it's so true. The church of our Lord, the New Testament church, is not a rest home for sinlessly perfect people. But it's a hospital for sinners. And thank God that the physician who's always on duty is the great physician, Jesus Christ. You know, you go into a hospital, especially if it's a situation in the ER, you know, Who's on duty? You know, there may be a great ER doctor who's on duty sometimes. There may be one who's not so great. You know, I mean, who do you want working on you folks? You want the guy that just barely made it through med school? Or you want the guy who was straight A's and really just top of his class? I know who I want. But when it comes to the Lord's church, the hospital, the haven for people who are flawed, fallible, and make mistakes, the greatest physician is always on duty. And that is a comforting thought. And that's what I want us to talk about this morning. Let's talk about his qualifications. Let me tell you, this, this was, I think this was about three years ago. <clears throat> you know, they say truth is stranger than fiction, and sometimes I suppose that's, that's so. But there was this doctor, quote, in Florida. Patients were coming to get augmentation, not where you would think, but on their backside, okay? But this doctor was injecting patients with cement, mineral oil, and fix-a-flat. This really happened. Turns out this, this person was neither a woman nor a doctor, but claiming to be both. The patient ended up in the hospital. The doctor ended up, of course, in prison. And all that's just to say this, when you go to a doctor, I don't know about you, I want a doctor who's qualified. I don't want somebody who's putting a fake diploma on the wall, or even as we sometimes refer to a diploma meal on the wall, one of those diplomas. I want somebody who's qualified, who knows what they're doing. Jesus, the great physician, is ultimately, exceptionally above and beyond anyone else ever qualified to be our great physician. Let's talk about why. Well, first of all, he's got an accredited degree. He has an accredited degree. It's, it's accredited by heaven itself. At his baptism in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, the latter part of that verse, God spoke from heaven, the Father, and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Matthew 17, verse 5, on the Mount of Transfiguration. You know, Peter, they, they see Moses and Elijah there, and he's talking with Jesus. Uh, they're talking with Jesus, and Peter says, Oh, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let's make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And, of course, they look up. They see nobody but Jesus. The voice from heaven says, This is my beloved Son. God has put his stamp of approval from heaven on the ministry, the life, the work, of Jesus Christ. And so when you come to Jesus, the great physician, you know you've got a doctor, a physician, who has an accredited degree. But not only that, he has knowledge. He's certainly got knowledge. 
John 2, 25 says, It needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. He doesn't need you to tell you. I mean, you go to a doctor now, and what is he going to say? The well, first thing he wants to know when you come in, either, maybe on the paperwork you're filling out, but the first thing he wants to know is, well, give me your symptoms. Can you imagine going into a doctor, you haven't filled out any paperwork, you haven't told him anything, and he comes in and he says, okay, Mr. Dollahite, you are experiencing some tightness in your chest, some uh, shortness of breath, and, uh, you know, and it begins to describe your symptoms to a T, and you say, how did you know that? Well, he says, I know all my patients. Well, can you imagine? You, you want to know, has this guy been spying on me or something? But Jesus has that knowledge because he is God. John 16, 30, the disciples told him this. They said, now we are sure that thou knowest all things. We know that you know all things. He's got knowledge. You don't have to wonder, is he going to understand what I'm saying? Sometimes I've tried to communicate with a, a doctor before. Maybe he didn't quite get what I'm saying. And, you know, I, I, again, I don't know about you, but... When I'm trying to communicate with a doctor, especially if it's something that might require surgery or something like that, I'm going to make sure, I'm going to go to great lengths to make sure we are on the same page, that we are communicating. But you don't have to worry about that with the great physician because he knows exactly what is wrong and he knows exactly what you need as a prescription to make it right. Not only that, he's experienced. Hebrews chapter 2. If you want to turn there, read several verses with me. Hebrews chapter 2, he, he is experienced. While you're turning there, let, let me tell you one time, back in 2004, it was August of 2004, I had, uh, I had ruptured a disc and I had suffered with it for a while and finally got to a position where I went to a <clears throat> um, spinal orthopedic. He ordered an MRI and he said, boy, you, you have really blown out your disc, something awful. And uh, he, he said, you know, bottom line is it's not going to get any better, but it's not going to get any worse if you can live this way. And I said, man, I'm, I'm not even 25 years old yet. I'm not living this way. And so uh, he, he, we tried the, the shot, I think epidural or whatever they called it. But I ended up having surgery. And so I remember they were about to put me under for this surgery. <clears throat> and Dr. Pierce comes in was his name. And he says, hey, Chad, uh, you know, you're about to, they're, they're about to sedate you and you're going to be anesthetized. And um, I just came in here to see if you have any last minute questions. Don't ask me why this occurred to me right then as I'm about to be put under. But all of a sudden, I had this image go through my mind of here I am, I'm asleep on the table, he's got me cut open, and he goes, oh, you know, I don't remember this. Uh, I, I've, I remember this a couple of years ago, I had one of these and it looked like this, but, you know, I don't know why that went through my mind. But I, just, I could just see in my mind him going, I'm at a loss, y'all. We got to call for some backup or something. And so I asked him, I said, I do have a question. So how many of these surgeries do you do a year? And that was what I was thinking. How much experience has he really had with this? I mean, because he doesn't do just spine surgery. So how, how many of these surgeries do you think you do about, uh, of these a year? And he said, I'd say probably about 100. I said, no more questions. I knew that was a man with experience. When you come to the great physician, you know, here's a man with experience. I mean, there's 6 billion people or 6 billion plus, I believe it is now, on this earth now. That's just living right now. Who knows what the number will be if we counted all people of all time. And he knows them inside and out, each and every one. Hebrews 2, I'm beginning at verse 14. He says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, Jesus, also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself had suffered being tempted, he is able to succor or help them that are tempted. You imagine going to a doctor and you say, Boy, you know, uh, I, 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 I found out that I have cancer. And he says, You know, I, I had cancer and I overcame it. Well, that's encouraging, isn't it? He's experienced that. Or, or maybe you say, you know what, I, I've, I've got a terrible, terrible case of heart disease. And he says, you know what, I, I had heart disease and I overcame it. Well, that'd be encouraging. And you say, you know what, I, I've got this uh, terrible muscle disease in my legs. He says, you know, I have that and I overcame it. Well, you know, I don't know about you, but at this point I'm starting to get suspicious that this doctor's just lying to me about all these diseases he's overcome. But with Jesus, the great physician... Spiritually speaking, he's overcome all the. He came 
We have not an high priest, Hebrews 4.15 on the board there. We have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He's faced every spiritual disease, at least every spiritual kind of disease, and he overcame it. He resisted temptation every single time. He's experienced. But the great physician is also capable of diagnosing and prescribing. If you want to continue reading a little bit further over in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13, <clears throat> he says, For the word of God is quick, living, and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of joints, the marrow, and of the... Of, uh, I'm getting that confused. Let me check it. Uh, to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints of marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. You want a doctor, when you go to a doctor today physically, who can correctly diagnose what you have. He can correctly prescribe what you need. Many of you here may have been victims of a doctor misdiagnosing. Now, you know, again, that's not to say that a doctor is a bad person or even necessarily a bad doctor. That's just to say sometimes it just says he's human. Miss, missing a prescription, well, that may just be a human error. But isn't it encouraging to know that when you go to the great physician, he'll never misdiagnose what is wrong. He will never prescribe the wrong medication. He'll never give you the wrong spiritual prescription. It's always going to be right. That's the confidence we have when we come to the great physician. He is also compassionate. Uh, <clears throat> Matthew 9, 36, he saw the people that they, they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And he had compassion. That's Matthew 9, 36. And we won't take time to read all these, but Matthew 14, 14, Matthew 15, 32, Matthew 20, 34. Over and over again, and not just in Matthew, in all the gospel accounts, it mentions Jesus had compassion. I went to a doctor one time. It was when my back was hurt. It was, it was, I went to him about twice. But um, this fellow was, was not the most... Uh, his bedside manner was somewhat lacking. I think we'll, we'll just leave it at that. But uh, he was a chiropractor. Wasn't helping. If anything, I felt worse. So uh, one day I'm, I'm laying on the sofa, and I'm actually not having pain that day. And so I thought, no way, when I'm actually feeling, if anything, worse... Am I going to get up from a comfortable position and go to see that fella? But I did the courtesy of calling the office to cancel my appointment so that they wouldn't, I wouldn't just be a no-show. Well, he answered the phone. And he has several things to say to me. He says, well, I, I told you it was going to take several visits. And I said, well, I, I know, but uh, are you not feeling any better? I said, well, you know, I'm, I'm actually not really convinced that I'm feeling any better at all. And he made a statement to me, something like, well, you're not going to get any better laying there on the sofa. I thought, boy, you, you've seen me for the last time. And that was the last time I saw that fellow or spoke to him. When you go to a doctor, you want a doctor that's compassionate. And, you know, and, and even today, we may sometimes tolerate a doctor whose bedside manner is lacking if we know he's that good. But in a perfect world, what would you want? You would want a doctor who is capable and he's compassionate. He's going to get it right, he's going to help me, and he's going to care about me. I want somebody who cares about me. That's one of the things why when kids, when they get hurt, who do they want? They don't want the most qualified person. They don't want to know is, it, it, hey, are you qualified to help me, sir? Who do they want? I want my mama. I want my daddy. Because my number one concern is I want some compassion. Jesus, the great physician, is compassionate. Not only that, he is unselfish. Though he were a son, yet learned the obedience to the things which he suffered, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation, not just to himself, to all them that obey him. Hebrews 5, 8, and 9. He wants you to be saved. He came to this earth for you to be saved. It wasn't for his own benefit. Make no mistake about it. Philippians 2 tells us he gave up so much to come to this earth. But why? For us. I don't want a doctor who's going to be selfish. Do you? I heard a doctor one time and said, he's, he's telling a patient, says, well, you know, to, to, get, this, to get this fixed, it's going to cost, cost you this amount of money. He says, you know, we can, 
We can do that in installments. Our office will work out payments with you about $600 a month. But he says, and if you want to get it really fixed up right, we can, we can add to that, and it would probably come out to about $700 a month, around four or five years. And the patient says, great day. That sounds like buying a new sports car. And the doctor said, too obvious, huh? That doctor was selfish. He's, he's, trying to get, he's trying to look out for his own interest. I want a doctor who's concerned about me. and He's not worried about number one. He's worried about helping others. Jesus, the great physician, was concerned about you and me. In fact, in the garden, as he knows that hour is approaching, what does he do? He falls on his face and he prays, Matthew 26, 39, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless. Isn't that a great word in that context? Nevertheless. Not my will, but thine be done. That's a doctor who's unselfish. I want that. I want that kind of person for my doctor. But that's the great physician. I mean, you don't have to wonder about his degree. You don't have to wonder about his level of knowledge, his capability to diagnose and prescribe. You don't have to wonder about, well, is he experienced? Is he going to get and say, well, you know, I forget about this. I I hadn't seen this kind of a case in a long, long time. Oh, no, he's experienced. You don't have to wonder about his compassion and his concern for others. He's demonstrated all of these time and time and time again. Well, let's talk about Jesus very quickly as an earthly physician. Jesus as an earthly physician. Notice a a few instances here of his physical ability as a physician. He healed the blind. Mark 10, 46 through 52. Blind Bartimaeus. And we're going to scan over some of these quickly for time's sake, but just... You may want to, you have the references there on your handout if you, if you have one, and if you don't, I'm sure there are some left over, and we'll get you some, or you can jot them down from the screen. Blind Bartimaeus in Mark chapter 10. John chapter 9, he heals a man there by, and tells him, uh, you know, he anoints his eyes with uh, clay and tells him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. One of my favorite accounts of healing there, you can see the compassion of Jesus come out in Mark chapter 9. He heals that man who was blind. Not only that, He healed the lame. Matthew 21, verse 14. John 5, 1 to 9. John 5 is the man there by the pool of Bethesda. The man's trying to wait. He's he's depending on some kind of superstitious angel stirring the water. No no evidence that ever ever actually happened. It's it's there in John's account. If we got into textual criticism, we could talk about the lack of evidence for that verse in the manuscripts. But it it was... People had this idea that an angel's going to come down and stir the waters, and the first one to get in there, after the angel stirs the waters, well, you're going to be healed. Well, here's a poor old man. He's lame. How's he going to get in the water? Even if that were true. And Jesus comes along, and he has compassion, and, and he heals him. The man that was lame, and he was healed. Jesus also healed the deaf. Mark chapter 7, 31 to 37, you have a man who's deaf and dumb. He can't speak. He can't hear. He's healed by Jesus. Matthew eleven five, 5, Jesus is pointing out to uh, John the Baptist. You know, John sent to Jesus and he, he wants to know, are you the one to come? It's almost like John is saying, I, I don't understand, Lord. I, I thought you were the coming Messiah. I thought I was preparing the way for you. And here I am in prison and you're doing nothing. And Jesus is, I don't know if I'd call it a rebuke so much as a reproof for John when he says in Matthew 11, verse 5, the blind received their sight, the lame walked. The lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have the gospel preached unto them, and blessed is he whoever shall not be offended in me. He says, God's on his time, John. And I think John learned that lesson well from from that little reproof by Jesus. But Jesus points out all these miracles, all these acts of physical healing that he's performing as the great physician. He also healed lepers, we just mentioned. Luke 17, 12 to 19, you know, he healed 10 lepers there. And that story is kind of famous because how many came back to thank him? Just the one. Jesus' famous question there in that context, where are the nine? Where are the nine? Were there not ten healed? But he healed the lepers. Mark 1, 40 to 42, and on and on we could go. He raised the dead. John 11, he raised Lazarus. Marshall Keeble used to say it's a good thing he said Lazarus come forth because if he'd have just said come forth, he'd have emptied all the graves. And, of course, one day he is going to simply say a generic command of come forth. And he's going to empty the graves. But he raised Lazarus from the dead, even to the point that when he tells him to roll back the tomb there in John 11, 
they say, Lord, it's been four days. You, you don't want us to take away that stone. It's going to smell awful because the decay had begun to set in. Jesus raised him from the dead, though. Luke chapter 8, verses 41 to 56, you see the daughter of a man named Jairus who is also raised from the dead. <clears throat> There's no doubt. Nobody with any sense, even his enemies, when he walked to this earth, many times had to make the statement, we cannot deny that he's done a notable, a great miracle. There's no getting around it. Jesus certainly is qualified as an earthly physician. And of course, there were many other miracles that he did. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, John says, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing you might have life through his name. These are written that you might believe. John 20, 30 and 31. Now here's where I want to finish up. Jesus as a spiritual physician. Jesus as a spiritual physician. Notice, he heals the blind today. In Mark, uh, Matthew rather, 13, verses 13 to 15, Jesus is, is talking about why he's using parables. And he says, Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, or Isaiah, which saith, Seeing by, by hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed or grown gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts, and I should heal them. Jesus says, Here are people that are they're blind, not physically, but spiritually. Not because they can't help it, but because they choose to close their eyes to the truth. Can you imagine somebody walking around that you know has good eyesight and, and they got their eyes just closed real tight and they say, you know, I, I don't understand, I can't see anything. You know, we'd say, you fool, open your eyes. And yet so many times spiritually that's what we do. People are blind to the truth. In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus is speaking to the church at Laodicea. I've got 14 and 19 there, but if, if you just drop down to verse 18, he's counseling this congregation. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And watch it. Anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. He says, you need to get your eyesight fixed. And he says, the great physician's got a prescription for you to open your eyes to the truth. Jesus also today heals the lame. John chapter 6, verse 61, Jesus knew that his disciples were murmuring at his saying there, and, and he says, doth this offend you? You say, well, what are we talking about here? Well, the idea of offend, the Greek word that's often translated in the King James Version, offend, it literally can mean to cause to stumble. It's the idea of you're walking along, and, and, and of course, the idea of walk, we, we sometimes talk about our spiritual walk, it, you know, it's a journey. And sometimes we stumble along the way. Well, that's the idea of falling. You know, we stumble. We, sometimes some people fall by the wayside. Some people stumble, but they, they get up and keep going. But that's the idea here. Someone who's lame, they've stumbled at the truth. Again, not because they can't understand it, but because they're refusing to do so. John 16, 1, Jesus says, These things have I spoken to you that, that you might not that you should not be offended. In Proverbs 10, verse 9, He that walketh uprightly walketh surely, but he that perverteth his ways shall be known. Jeremiah 10, 23, O Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his own steps. When you're stumbling around in the darkness trying to find your way, the great physician comes along and he can heal your spiritual lameness. But not only that, he heals the deaf. <clears throat> Matthew 13, we already noticed the passage there where Jesus says he can heal those who have turned a deaf ear to the truth. 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 4, after he says, preach the word, he drops down to verse 3 and he says, for the time will come when they'll not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. We often use the expression, I told him, but he just turned a deaf ear to what I said. And how many people to this day turn a deaf ear to the truth? Jesus heals spiritual leprosy, sin, in other words. 
Luke 19, 10, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Jesus said, this is my blood of the New Testament which is shed for many. Why, Jesus? For the remission, the forgiveness of sins. He's still curing spiritual leprosy to this day. And not only that, he's going to raise the dead one day. In Matthew, uh, John 5, 26, 29, but really in verse 28, Jesus says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth they that have done good to the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. You see there on your handout, the, the diagnosis for each and every one of us is sin. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The prognosis is death. But there is hope. The great physician is in. He will heal our sin sickness. But you know what? When you come to the great physician, you're going to come to him because you, you believe in him. I, I don't believe you would come to the great physician for healing if you did not believe in him. You come to him for healing and he's going to give you some prescriptions. Brother Marshall Keeble has a, a great sermon but you can still listen to it online called The Great Physician. And he talks about some prescriptions that Jesus is going to give to heal your sin sickness. One of those prescriptions he's going to say is you've got to turn away from sin. You've got to quit living for self and start living for God. That's what we call repentance. He's also going to give you a prescription and say, you've got to confess me before men that you believe that I am the Son of God and that I'm the Savior of the world, Matthew 10, 32 and 33. Not just a one-time thing. That certainly is required, but... It's an ongoing thing, every day of my life, confessing him before men. But he's also going to give you a prescription. He's going to say, you need to be immersed in water. Have your sins washed away. Then he'll add you to his church. Then he'll take you in, and you'll be his patient, and he will use his blood to continually cleanse your sins as you walk in the light, 1 John 1, 7. Maybe you need to take that prescription and become a Christian this morning. No better time than right now. Brother, sister in Christ, are you sick again? Have you had a relapse? Maybe you need to take that prescription of repentance and prayer that's required for the child of God to get back in a right relationship with God. Whatever it may be, understand the great physician is just that. He is great. The greatest physician, I believe we might be better off calling him. Jesus is the very best that heaven has to offer and what a shame it is if we miss out on it. If I do, and if you do, it'll be nobody's fault but our own. Come to him for healing. Won't you do it now as we stand and sing to encourage you?
We'll close this morning with number 15, Amazing Grace, verses 1 and 6. Before we do that, let me thank everyone for your presence here. We're so thankful to have you here at our worship. Invite you back anytime you can be here. We do have our evening worship at 6 p.m. Remember the VBS wrap-up meeting at 5 o'clock. And we look forward to seeing you at our evening worship. If you filled out an attendance card, please pass it to the center. It will be picked up as we sing this final song, after which we'll be led in a word of prayer. <clears throat> Amazing grace. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to meet here once again on this first day of week, study another portion of thy word. We're thankful for the lesson that we've heard here this morning. We pray that much good can come from it. Give us the courage to take it and apply it to our lives. Please bless those who request a part in our prayer. Return them back to their most worn health if it be thy will. Be with us now as we depart from this building. Keep us safe until we meet at the next point in time. Forgive us where we fail thee in Christ's name. Amen.